Hello to everyone. It is my great pleasure to express our very warm welcome to our first HHL expert. I am very excited to see so many of you tonight and I hope you've all been doing well and you have been coping well with the current situation. So what is the HHL expert talk and why are we actually doing this? The HHL expert talk is a virtual talk series with which HHL aims to address current key topics in research to broaden a knowledge transfer on current social, economic and political topics led by HHL experts. To briefly introduce myself. My name is Sigrid Fischer and I'm delighted to be moderating the HHL expert talk series. I studied journalism and performance psychology at Indiana University in the United States and continued with a Master's of Science in Performance Psychology um, at Edinburgh University, where I also worked later on in my career. At HHL, I am now heading up the Alumni Relations Department. So before we're heading into tonight's first talk, I want to give you a brief overview of HHL's facts and figures. HHL was established in, uh, 120 years ago in Leipzig, Germany. It is our mission to educate entrepreneurial, responsible and effective business leaders through outstanding teaching, research and practice. We're driven by excellence to benefit our students, stakeholders and society. So where are we today? Today, we have more than 700 students in our five programs, which is the full-time and part-time Masters of Science in Management, the full-time and part-time MBA, as well as our PhD program. We're proud to have more than 60 nations represented within our student body and to have an active network that contains more than 2,500 alumni. As a entrepreneurial minded university, we're particularly proud that more than 300 startups were founded and co-founded by HHL alumni and five of these are unicorns. So privately held startups with a value of more than 1 billion US dollars. We're also proud to have strong bonds to more than 130 partner universities across the world. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our first expert junior professor Dr. Eric Meyer. Eric joined HHL as junior professor in retail and multi-channel management in 2015, focusing on topics of digital retailing and marketing. At the same time, he also heads up the HHL reInvent Retail Think Tank, which focuses on developing and transferring knowledge between research and business. Besides all of this, he researches on e-commerce, online marketing topics, publishes in international journals, and is also strongly engaged as a reviewer. I now want to hand over to Eric. So very much enjoy tonight. Okay, everybody, uh, I think we'll be getting going. Um, thank you everybody for um, who joined early for having waited. Um, this is our HHL expert talk. Thanks, Sigrid, for the little introduction. Uh, I'm Eric Meyer, and I today want to talk about consumption and retail in times of Corona. Um, so, if we if we follow the the, the popular press, um, we get the impression that many ch things have changed, and that is actually the topic about which I want to talk about. Which which aspects of consumption have changed during the current crisis? So, if we follow press clippings. Um, we firstly get the impression, well, there is going to be a lasting uh, change in retail. Huh? The coronavirus pandemic will likely leave a lasting legacy in retail. Uh, in German, we can talk of the, the um, Durchbruch für den Lebensmittel Online Handel, that is, online grocery retailing is going to be the next big thing, the, the upcoming uh, change is going to be here. We follow this along, there's multiple themes which are evolving in the, in the popular press. For instance, uh, that Netflix will be strongly affected, either for the for the negative side, that is in the United States, for instance, being discussed, or um, on the positive side, which is co commonly being discussed in Germany, Netflix as the biggest winner of the Corona crisis. 
And if we follow along, we get to the usual suspects. Uh, if somebody talks about e-commerce, about online, about consumption, uh, Amazon usually is not far. So um, some people claim uh, that Amazon was predominant and powerful before the crisis, and now it's on its way to dominance. Um, and even if we follow the German discourse, uh, some claim that Amazon will be the biggest winner of the crisis. Um, but we can also ask ourselves what will happen in the long run. And then we see this discussion coming on about this so-called new normal. Uh, what is going to happen in the long run? Are there going to be lasting changes in consumer psychology or not? Um, and finally, uh, we can look at aspects like uh, pricing. Right? Are prices going to be positively or negatively affected? Um, a very uh, witty quote from the Zeit in German, uh, when does the, when get the Bucher endlich offline? When does the price usury uh, stop to change uh, offline? Uh, and what we are going to do today is we are going to be looking at different aspects of, um, of uh, pattern changes with regards to retail and consumption. And this is my, uh, my topic for today. Um, so I'm talking about uh, how consumption pattern changed. I'm trying to do this in a bit of a data-driven way. Well, crisis is still new, so data is scarce, but what I'm trying to do is make the most of the data we have and give you an overview of how consumption patterns in retail changed. So let's start off with the first uh, topic we are going to be talking about. And I'm using the quotes from press to, to, to signify, well, this is the, com the common dis discussion which we have, and I'm trying to, well, reflect a bit on whether this is the case or not. So let's look at the first aspect, and the quote is, consequence of Corona, a breakthrough for online grocery delivery. Um, if we look at if we look at the actual data, and the first point I want to, to use here is uh, the revenue development within re U.S. retailing, we can see a fairly uh, differentiated pattern between different types of products. So what this graph here shows you is a development of uh, of U.S. retail sales in different categories uh, over the top over the last let's say one year and a quarter. So starting from uh, beginning of 2019 to now. Uh, March 2020. That's the latest data which we have. And if we look at this, we can see if our hypothesis is uh, that e-commerce or online retail and online food delivery is growing, we see that, well, that is the, the orange line with the dots here. We have a substantial increase here in e-commerce uh, delivery to 130% um, year, over, uh, year over year. However, other aspects, and this is particularly grocery, that is non-online grocery, have grown much stronger um, during, during uh, March when the, when the crisis and the corona lockdown started to hit the United States. So in summary here, we can see that, well, while e-commerce um, and non-store retail has been growing uh, by 5% versus February, there's other aspects which are growing more strongly. And this is, I think, also a common theme which, which we see in that if, um, if, we, if we evaluate the growth of online grocery, we always have to evaluate this against an overall growth in grocery consumption because people are spending time at home. That is, even if online grocery is growing, overall grocery consumption, domestic food consumption is growing, and against that we have to evaluate it. And so we can see as a first kind of takeaway that yes, e-commerce is growing, yes, online grocery is likely to be growing, but grocery consumption is going to grow overall. So let's get a bit more detailed. And what I'm trying to do here is, or what I will be employing, is I'm going to look at Google Trends data. That in itself yields information about search interest. And search interest uh, can, be, can be used to uh, indicate demand. Because people usually, when they're looking for something, let's say a website like HHL, they would not type directly hhl.de in their browsers, but they would be Googling it because they're too lazy to type the whole website title. So um, search terms can be used as an indicator for demand. And this is what I'm also going to do when I'm looking at uh, the following information. So let's look at, Google, at the Google Trends analysis of certain product categories. Um, if we compare multiple categories here, for instance, if we look at for instance, do it yourself products that's in German Baumarkt, uh, uh, compare this against, for instance, furniture, books, or groceries, we can see, uh, see a pattern evolving here. If we look at the, 
at the lockdown period, which in Germany was week 12 of, of 2020, we can see that uh, certain product categories peaked. Particularly, we could see here that online that the demand for groceries and the search for groceries and, uh, and food was peaking in terms of demand here. Now, whilst other categories, particularly the DIY category, they peaked much later. That is, we can see an increase in the, uh, in the demand for certain categories over time. Now, but we can see that this happening sequentially. Whilst we start with things like groceries, these are the basic demands. Once people stuck around at home for an extensive period of time, they got bored and then decided to do something about their homes. This is when, period, uh, when, when, when products such as uh, do-it-yourself products um, become more interesting to consumers. But we also can see that other aspects, for instance, furniture um, was highly relevant uh, to consumers after the crisis. My interpretation here is, that this reorientation to a domestic lifestyle also raises awareness for different aspects of domestic life. Well, and now furniture and uh, the stuff in our gardens, which we need from the DIY market, that is stuff which gets into focus. Uh, and hence, there's an increasing demand for this. But we can also see that demand for other products, uh, such as fashion, for instance, uh, has declined substantially um, during the crisis. Interestingly, also, um, also books have not seen that strong interest and have been increasing afterwards. Now, if we um, if we detail this a bit more, let's look at um, let's look at uh, different terms for um, for for grocery and online grocery in specific. Now, so we notice well that food is increasing, um, grocery products are of increasing relevant. I think everybody who tried to go to the supermarket and get stuff noticed this. But how about online grocery? Uh, this is the supposed winner of, um, of, of the corona crisis. Um, if we look at this, we can see that online grocery, uh, that is the orange line here with the, with the ball markers, that has increased substantially in, in search interest and in demand during the, during the lockdown. Uh, if we look at week 12, and week, uh, week 13 here, that is almost 1,600 times as much demand as uh, prior to the crisis. So we could see or could interpret this as, well, this tremendous increase is going to be or create a lasting change. However, if we continue over the development, if we look at, at today, for instance, our week 18, there we can already see that the demand for, um, for online grocery has return to the normal. So one interpretation of this is that whilst the demand for online grocery has really, really strongly increased, it also has quite strongly um, dropped again uh, because people are not as afraid because they got used to the situation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we can see a return here. And if we compare this then to other categories, Whilst, um, whilst online um, on food online it has showed the strong, strongest increase, also other things have uh, have seen an increase. Uh, people looked for ordering books online, pharmacy online, even shoes, uh, fashion items, which are not as strongly demanded right now, have seen an increase. So um, we have to evaluate this strong increase in online grocery delivery first against an overall increase in the demand for grocery as people spend time at home. Secondly, against an overall increase in, uh, in online delivery. Uh, and, and look, taking this into account, this strong increase, well, at least um, gets into perspective. Uh, and then we see, and this is this development down here, that, that the strong increase in online grocery also saw a strong decrease. Well, who's profiting most from this? Uh, if we look at the retailers here, uh, we can see that the retailer who profited most from this uh, overall in Germany is Rewe. Uh, with their delivery services, they've been investing in this for, for a few years. They also, show, uh, they also saw the strongest uh, increase in demand for their website. And I can then assume that this will also translate in, uh, in many more orders. Uh, we can see uh, other things such as, um, such as drink, drink, drink delivery here, um, Dost Express, which also seen a, seen a later increase, um, but not as tremendously and coming from a lower level. Bear in mind, um, all we see here, all these indicators, their relative changes versus the previous year. 
what I've done is to, uh, to get rid of seasonality, I've compared all the statistics here to let's say February or week 12 or week 15 in the previous year to ensure that we were not while well, being confronted with seasonality effects such as spring is do it, do, do it yourself time, something like that. So that should not affect our results here. So we can see in Germany overall, Rewe has seen this strong increase, but we already now are almost back to the prior uh, pre-crisis level in demand. Right? Same pattern follows if we go to Saxony. Um, interestingly, here the demand peak for online grocery was a week after the, uh, the shutdown. So the Saxons seem to be well, somewhat slow in adopting to, uh, to new changes, whatever the new changes might be. So oh, um, the question is, is this here to stay? Um, and I would I would factor in two factors here. One is um, is fear, um, being anxious about the development, and the other is convenience. If you read commentators about online groceries and online food delivery, many will say, well, people are here because they they notice the convenience, and now they will they will continue with uh, with online grocery. I would say that well. The focus in the current situation, people order online and order online grocery because they're afraid. And we can also see this in the data. If we look at the United States, we can see that um, we have over the, the weeks in March a strong increase in fear and concern about being in public. And that strong increase uh, correlates, positively correlates, with an increase in online grocery purchase and food delivery purchase. Uh, our data are a bit patchy here. Uh, we don't have consistent lines, but we can see that also in the reaction uh, there is a, there is a trend. So it seems to be that people are buying online grocery not because it's more convenient or because they predominantly believe in this in the present situation, but because um, they are afraid. Uh, and this also then reflects in in the download of grocery apps uh, as an indicator. So we can see here once the crisis starts, people downloaded this is that the focus um, and the motivation for people to buy online groceries is out of fear and anxiety. Uh, however, there is the possibility that they might recognize convenience uh, of online delivery and um, that they would then continue with this behavior. However, as we see, the, the, um, the sales volume or the, the visitor volume has already dropped. So I am hesitant or doubtful whether um, whether convenience perceptions are really that high and whether people would really um, would really like migrate to to online grocery delivery. Uh, partially because potentially in the crisis with everybody asking, convenience might not have been as high. Partially also because people might not have as much available income to order um, order from online grocery, which might also be perceived as more costly. So the takeaway here is that well, although we see a market step change for online grocery, that um, online grocery retail is not going to be the dominant form of grocery shopping anytime soon. But my reading is rather that consumption patterns will revert somewhat to the normal, probably on a higher level, but it's not going to be that everybody is going to order uh, online grocery from now on only. Let's go to the second aspect. Uh, second discussion and second quote, which oftentimes come, is that Netflix is the biggest winner of the uh, Corona crisis. So let's look at the figure here. If we again look at the at the demand development, again this is uh, year over year, so we see changes versus the previous um, previous week of the year. We can see the orange line with the with the ball markers here, which is Netflix. Yes, we can see that Netflix has increased its uh, demand to its website over the uh, over the corona crisis. However, uh, we can also see that other streaming services have increased much more strongly. Well, on the one hand side, there is uh, there is Disney here. That's the gray dotted line. They have increased much, much more strongly. But the reason for here is not so much the corona crisis, but rather that they launched the service in Germany uh, together with a great content, which was the Star Wars um, Star Wars trilogy. So people um, were, were anxious to join that and Googled it because they were interested in the content. At least is my interpretation. But also if we compare this 
to, uh, to other developments. And this is particularly interesting here. If we just look at, at the ordinary streaming content, which we get uh, through our public uh, public TV stations, if we go to uh, look at, at, at the demand for RD Mediathek, yeah, we can see that they also saw a substantial increase here in uh, in the demand. So if we look at if we look at the overall demand changes um, po post post Corona until prior to Corona, we can see that Disney had the strongest increase. But our interpretation here was well, it's it's ex driven by content maybe. Right? And Netflix saw a substantial increase, but it's not that much higher than if we look at the public TV stations. Uh, so we can see that um, we can see that the um, that the overall development here is positive, but it's not that positive. Uh, on the other hand side, we can also see the losers here. Sky, uh, much less demand. This is because there's no soccer. Uh, they are very strongly associated with soccer. Hence, people are not that interested in it if there's no sports on Sky. Uh, if we look at the, the quarterly report from, uh, from Netflix here to drill a bit deeper, we can also see um, that this picture substantiates. Yes, um, they might have grown during the Corona crisis, but really not that strongly. What I've done here is I've broken out the number of paying subscribers over different regions, US, Europe, Latin America, Asia Pacific. And we can see here, well, firstly, that the levels differ. Uh -huh. um, if this is again year over year, a quarter over quarter change. In the United States and Canada, there's not much happening anymore. This is up here. Uh -huh. There is no real substantial change. There's a growth, but the growth is really limited. These, these markets have reached, reached saturation. A lot of people have, um, have Netflix already. There's not that much to gain. And here we can also see, well, the growth in the Corona quarter, we could say, is not higher than the rest. And this replicates in all of the other um, geographies. We can see that, well, they grow strongly year over year in those markets where they don't have a high penetration. But this growth by far did not accelerate in, uh, in the Corona quarter Q1 2020. Uh, except potentially here in, in Asia Pacific, where we've seen somewhat of an increase, but even that is not that radical. So we see that the growth in the subscriber numbers here, uh, this is the paying subscribers which we see, is really not that strong. Uh, we see a market saturation also in the big markets. Uh, however, if we look at what's commonly discussed, uh, Netflix is, 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 is growing because um, people are watching a lot. Well, this binge watching is not good for their income. They're operating on a subscription model. So if more people who are already paying subscribers binge watch, the only thing which is going to increase is their costs. Because while well, only if new subscribers join, then will they make additional revenue. We can also see this if we look at their, uh, their net and operating income. Um, both are really very much in line with what we've seen over the last, um, last quarters. So this re reports the overall or the pure uh, operating margin income. Uh, we can see, for instance, in terms of operating income, yes, there was a growth in the last quarter, but this was lower than the Q3 2019. Net income is really very much in line with what we've seen previously. Uh, so here we don't see a lot of positive developments. Summing up, uh, there's six reasons why I believe that Netflix um, is, well, in the mid run, not going to profit strongly from the Corona crisis. Firstly, binge watching costs them money rather than doesn't bring them money because the services are going to be needed more than less uh, and it doesn't bring them money. Um, new subscribers bring them money. And um, second, domestic demand did not increase substantially because the market is already saturated. Uh, thirdly, foreign demand may falter or, or be reduced because Streaming is uh, more of a luxury in low income markets and if their economy is not doing well, people might cut down on uh, luxury items. Um, fourth, they might have a long term problem as no or limited new content is produced and consumers might ca cancel their subscriptions. Um, fifth aspect, um, the, the streaming market is overall growing uh, and other players, for instance, Disney might win customers because um, of special, specific content. Disney might be good on children, children are at home, hence uh, they might have profited even more strongly than the Netflix from the current situation. And finally, the, the company also doesn't have a good credit rating. So in an environment where refinancing is difficult, 
they might also have um, difficulties refinancing. So summing up um, for Netflix, the, the crisis is unlikely to have uh, substantially profited Netflix. Um, the adoption is already high in core markets and a high utilization doesn't bring them money. So everybody watching more Netflix doesn't help them. They need more subscribers. And there we don't really see an indication that the number of paying subscribers has substantially increased during the, uh, the Corona crisis. Third, um, third uh, hypothesis here or third statement. Uh, Amazon was already powerful. The coronavirus pandemic cleared the way to dominance. Well, firstly, I would, uh, I would question that they're not already rather very dominant, um, but that taken aside, let's look at uh, how strongly Amazon uh, profited from, from the corona crisis. Same, um, same approach again, we're looking at demand for, uh, for the different websites. And here we can see, well, again, a differentiated picture. Amazon is marked here as, uh, as the orange line with the, with the balls. We can see that, well, after the crisis, yes, people purchased more, there was more demand for Amazon. And um, I think here this, this Googling Amazon works particularly well as people are usually too lazy to type. Um, we can see that there is a demand, but other companies have seen a strong demand here as well. Oh, we can see, for instance, the German Otto Group has seen a substantial increase here. And even companies like Zalando, after the initial dip here in the first weeks, they are now seeing somewhat of an increase in, uh, in demand again. And we can also see, as initially, this strong focus on do it yourself. Up here, Otto, uh, Obi, sorry, uh, the DIY market, they have probably seen the, the, the strongest increase because people try to get products which they could otherwise not obtain. Um, also because OBI is coming from a much lower level. Also, if we look at the overall development, um, whilst OB has received the most attention of our reference set here during the, um, during the pandemic uh, situation, they are small in terms of search interest on, the, on, on an absolute level. Uh, Amazon is by far attracting the most, the most uh, interest on an absolute level, but their growth versus their baseline has not been as strong uh, with only 25% in the weeks after the lockdown compared to the weeks before the lockdown. But let's look at, a, a bit more into, a, into the detail. If we look at the, the Amazon quarterly reports and, uh, and assess how they, how they perform, we can see, well, uh, what we see here is that their business is actually fairly stable. What this shows us is, um, is the revenue development by type of their business. So we compare their online retailing business with their market marketplace revenue. That is the stuff they, the fees they generate through their marketplace sellers and also compare this with other things. So uh, Amazon Web Services, that's the servers, subscriptions, that's mainly prime physical retail, um, that is mainly Whole Foods. So we can see here, that um, if we compare these figures, yes, we can see an increase year over year. So the Q1 2020 is better than Q1 2019. Well, but Amazon is growing very strongly anyhow. So um, this, this increase in, in terms between Q1 2020 to, to Q1 2019 is not astonishing at all. To the contrary, if we look at, let's say, our Corona situation here, roughly, we can see that their performance is actually going down. Uh, so their retail sales and their marketplace revenues from commissions is going down. Uh, and reasons for here are because they had to focus their, of their delivery on certain items which are, um, which are required for kind of people's basic supplies on medical items, these types of things. That is, their um, their their overall sales go down simply because they have logistics issues. They have to focus on essential items, or they focus on essential items. Um, they might have lower supply from from their marketplace sellers from China, for instance. And so there's multiple factors which explain this decline in the uh, in the revenue. And also, if we look now at the more I'd say financially more interesting aspects of the operating profit, we can see that. Uh, our Q1 2020 has been rather not uh, as successful as before. 
if we compare this with Q1 2019 and Q1 2018, so always the um, beginning of the year quarters, we can see that the um, that the operating profit has declined both on the relative and on an absolute level. Uh, that is, we see that the relative profit margin has, has declined by 2% and the absolute profits um, have, have also gone down. Uh, and we can see here uh, why are, where these changes are coming from. Um, we can see, well, firstly, there seems to be seemingly an increase in marketing spending. So what we see here is the P&L background by the different cost aspects um, of the overall revenue, 15% uh, are fulfillment, 12% are marketing, 6% um, are technology and content, 2% are G&A, and the majority obviously is cost of goods sold, uh, abbreviated with COX, cost of goods sold. Um, so we can see that, well, seemingly they have increased their marketing spending during the crisis that might have been pushed against the revenue decline, might have also been like acquisitions without conversions. That is, you acquire traffic to your website, but people don't convert. So you have to pay, but you don't get, uh, you don't generate revenue. We can see a decline here in the, um, in the technology and content costs might have been as they haven't acquired new video and content through um, through Amazon Prime. And we can see, well, fairly stable fulfillment costs, slight increase, nothing much changed here. Also, Cox share didn't, uh, uh, didn't change much. There's a slight increase here, um, which might have indicated that the, uh, that the profitability or they sold less profitable um, products. Now, um, how would you usually approach this? Uh, HHL, if we want to, to deep dive or delve into and explain uh, these changes, questions such as uh, has Amazon's operating profit increased or decreased? By the way, that's the question which I uh, set my students to work upon in one of my last latest classes on online marketing. And um, what we would usually do is we would do the following, uh, uh, develop a driver tool. And this is one, one approach with which one could detail whether um, or where the, where the developments are coming from. So if we want to look at profitability, one thing to, we could look at is potentially at the profit margin by order. What would influence this? Uh, what would influence this profitability of any order which somebody places on, on Amazon? Um, obviously, the, the cost of goods sold would influence this. Uh, that is, how much do they have to spend to acquire a certain product? They would have fulfillment costs in the sense of, well, how much uh, do they have to pay for the delivery? Uh, they would have marketing costs in terms of customer acquisition predominantly, uh, general administrative costs, and all these cost components would be divided then through the order size. It is, if for any order we look at, how much have they spent in terms of buying the products, delivering the products, acquiring customers. The bigger the order size, obviously the, um, the more profitable the, uh, the transaction are because all these standardized aspects such as fulfillment, uh, marketing costs, G&A are split over a larger order. Uh, they're, um, they digress stronger over these larger orders. Well, and if we do then a driver, driver tree, which we commonly do in class, how you can break this down? What influences my cost of goods sold for, for an order? Uh, for instance, the product mix. I might be able to sell more or less profitable products. For instance, um, my purchasing power as Amazon, do I get better or worse prices? Now in the crisis, for instance, the product mix is really interesting. Uh, which products have they sold? If they have to give preference, so medical items and items of daily need, these might not be the most profitable items. Uh, usually they might focus on items which really have a good um, contribution margin. Well, now if they have to sort their sales or prioritize their sales and presentation due to other criteria such as health or whatever, um, their product mix might be less favorable in terms of um, the, 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 the contribution margin per product, which might lead to a decline in um, in the profitability, which we have seen, by the way. Um, if we look at the fulfillment costs, uh, there's also multiple drivers here which might be affected through the uh, corona crisis. Logistics wages, they've increased their, their wages by $2 in the United States. Logistics effort, 
more hygiene for the drivers, etc. How would you need to invest more resources to do it? Um, delivery effort. Which products are being delivered, for instance, might be depend on uh, on product size. Uh, if you deliver bigger um, bigger items, uh, that might be more costly. If you deliver uh, things which are more difficult to handle, and um, if you deliver more smaller items, these types of things, uh, and also the cost per delivery. What do your delivery companies, uh, DHL or or others, UPS, charge you for any delivery? Are they passing on sales, etc.? Uh, and finally, then. How does this relate to the order size? If people order smaller batches, more smaller orders, then your fulfillment costs will go down. Um, marketing costs also play a role. And this way we can detail out what the drivers is. In this sense, my explanation is that, well, due to the shift in the product mix and the crowding out of, uh, of marketplace retailers, we have um, reduced sales and also reduced, or let's say reduced growth they still grow, but they could have grown potentially even stronger had they not been focused, been forced to focus on essential items. You can also see this when we look at the uh, at the marketplace sales development. What you see here is in this graph is the development of third party sales relative to Amazon's overall revenue. So they started off at a at a really small share down here, and now the marketplace makes up 60% of uh, of Amazon's sales on their uh, on their website, uh, and this is something which is particularly strongly affected by the crisis. The marketplace sellers might have logistics issues. Preferred delivery might have um, deprioritized them. Non-production of products in China might affect all these um, all these merchants coming from China and Asia. So my projection would be that if we get data on this that the share of the, the, the marketplace sales go down during the crisis. So we see two things on the one hand side in their own retail offering. They, um, they might have to focus on items or have had to focus on items which are not as profitable and this reducing not only sales but also profitability combined with higher logistics effort. And they also forewent sales on the uh, on the marketplace side that is where they are only the, the platform where the sales happen. And this is also leading to a decline in, uh, in revenue. So my evaluation here, if we, look at, uh, if, we, uh, if we look at Amazon, is that, well, yes, Amazon's revenue increase continues, but my conviction is that Corona actually did not help in this. The profitability declined and a business, or if in their term, the growth potentially as usual, would probably have been better for their overall development because this reprioritization um, led to a decline in revenue. And also, if you look at the consumer side, because delivery times were going up on Amazon, people were ordering from other websites uh, and hence that induced the migration to other retailers. Uh, so I believe that Amazon was actually negatively affected um, from the Corona crisis. And I think Q1 results um, substantiate this evaluation. Okay, um, last aspect. Uh, Corona, I'm using the, the, the German claim here because this is rather witty. Yeah? Coronavirus, wann geht der Wucher endlich offline? Ah, it's, a, it's a pun on words. When does uh, online uh, price usury stop and we finally get fair prices? Ah, by the Zeit. Um, but this is also why probably it's a bit witty. Um, so, if we look at this, uh, we, we could test this with products which are perceived to have grown very strongly during the crisis, well, which actually grew very strong. You know? There is the good old toilet paper. Uh, I think everybody tried to buy toilet paper uh, during the last months and had issues getting it. Um, there is freezers. There seems to be a strong increase in the demand for freezers. Um, so um, let's like this as a sample product and let's take a look at fashion. Uh, so fashion was less demanded. So let's um, let's check what whether the prices in fashion change. And if we evaluate this, think back to your good old microeconomic days with Arnes Wilkes. Uh, the image here is not Arnes, but is uh, Adam Smith. Um, we usually evaluate price and uh, supply and demand development, uh, supply and demand um, by the invisible hand. Adam Smith invisible hand. If we have an increase here, for instance, in the demand, that is people need more toilet paper or need more freezers, 
what we would expect here is that we have an increase in the price. Uh, this is what we would expect from, let's say, basic, basic microeconomic uh, theory. No? Demand increase, price increase. So if this had happened, uh, the side would have been would have been right in their uh, left-leaning evaluation of the market uh, of the market mechanism, saying, "Well, there's this usury going on online, and people are exploiting this." Well, let's look at the uh, let's look at the stats. Uh, I'm using data from the German uh, Statis, uh, the Statis, Statistisches Bundesamt here, that is the German uh, statistical uh, service. Um, and we can see that, well, there were price changes if we compare uh, March 2019 with March 2020, but they were both positive and negative. Some products went more expensive, others went, uh, got less expensive. So some items such as sugar items or media or meat, they've increased in their prices. But even here, the increase is not very, very strong. I mean, 20 percent on uh, on a kilogram of sugar is probably about five cents. So that's not a financially very relevant, very, very relevant increase. Um, while other things have decreased substantially, for instance, here, uh, the price of butter, which uh, many German consumers take as a um, as a core indicator of prices in, uh, in grocery retail has decreased and other things have decreased as well. Uh, namely, uh, everything which is related to oil, and uh, this has de decreased the process. And so we see both an increase and a decrease. If we want to push the evaluament, evaluation, probably grocery items have increased a bit more. Uh, many of the items which have seen a price increase, sausages, for instance, um, non-alcoholic drinks, fish, um, fruit, they have seen a price increase versus the last year. What we don't see is um, price increases in the majority of all product categories, including, including uh, toilet tissue or toilet paper. So this product has not been in the market categories. And if also if we take a look at the um, at the more detailed development, this is um, the price development over the past um, 15 months. We see well, this is not um, this is not indexed. It's not a comparison quarter over quarter as before. But we see the pure um, price index development for these uh, for these categories. That um, if we take the crisis to be roughly around here, um, we can see that well, there is no indication for a strong price increase beyond the normal seasonality. Fashion items, there is a seasonality which always comes at this uh, oh, sorry, at this at this indication. Uh, so this is not um, is not a corona induced uh, price increase. Rather, to the contrary, we would expect that prices go down here. But for all other categories, food and drinks, toilet paper included, um, there is no real price increase. And also, if you take a look in more detailed at, at price crawlings, there is no indication that there has been an exploitation. Uh, there are certainly exploitations on the Amazon marketplaces where people start selling, um, I don't know, um, cleaning products for really high prices, disinfectants for really high prices, uh, FP6 masks for really high prices, but this is kind of single cases of uh, marketplace arbitrage more than an overall across the board uh, increase in, in the prices. I've also done a bit of or used a bit of uh, price crawling here for a specific product. For instance, I've looked at the prices for fridges at home base. This is a UK retailer for um, for different home pro home related products. And there we actually see the contrary. Oh, this might uh, might not be representative, the, the fridges which that company sold. But here, I mean, during the, the majority of the crisis, this is probably when it started hitting um, hitting the UK more strongly, there rather was a price decrease rather than an increase. So also here, if we look at the individual product level, we do not see an indication for an across the board um, price increase. Also coming back or summarizing, we see that while well, prices change, but there's no indication that market participants, mainly retailers um, across the board, uh, use this situation to increase their prices. Rather, we see really price stability. We see this on an overall level. We see this in the major product categories, and we also see this as here for our sample products, which um, which have been 
which uh, which have been very much in demand, such as freezers, which which people were supposedly buying much more frequently. Um, so the takeaway here um, is that there is no indication that suppliers generally exploited demand. Uh, there is cases of marketplace arbitrage. They are going to be people which uh, which sell more on there or take really high prices on the Amazon marketplace, but this is not an across the board phenomenon. OK, uh, last aspect, um, will the corona coronavirus make a lasting change to consumer psychology? This is interesting because it brings in a bit of a, the, the psychology and uh, psychological component. And usually in our in, in our classes, in our teaching, we would not only focus on describing the economic results, but we would also try to describe the drivers behind this because the drivers would enable us to to predict what happens in the long run so we'll try to understand also what happens in consumers minds and this is also what i want to do and these three images here on the left hand side sim signify things i think which all of us have seen um, the first is uh, what we could call about well, this over demand in stockpiling for certain products are uh, people with the hoarding uh, toilet paper what can explain this and will this will this stay? Uh, on the one hand side, the stockpiling is, uh, is based on uncertainty avoidance. People are generally, consumers generally tend to be risk averse and try to avoid um, things which they can't predict. Uh, and one uncertainty is how strong will the supply be with, uh, with items which I need in my daily life uh, due throughout the crisis. And this is fairly natural. I think everybody has this to a different degree. And in the beginning of the situation, there was a strong uncertainty about whether supply would last. So people were um, uncertainty avoiding in their behavior to, uh, to buy things. Some might have overreacted, but essentially this is uncertainty avoidance. This is combined with, um, with prospect theory. Uh, as you recall from your class, potentially you've been at HHL, losses loom larger than gains. So the risk of a potential non-available product looms much larger than a potential gain, e.g. that the prices might decrease. Both factors combined, so uncertainty avoidance and, and, and prospect theory, however, do not yield an indication that, that the, uh, the specific consumption patterns, i.e. people overbuying groceries, overbuying coronavirus, will last beyond the crisis. There might be a, some high risk perception, and hence people would generally have a higher stock in, in items. That is, they would have, I don't know, a bit more canned, canned products than beforehand, a bit more flour than beforehand. But there is no indication that there is going to be an overall longer demand for, let's say, uh, more toilet paper. Uh, next aspect, uh, queuing after reopening. I think we've all seen this as well. Stores are opening and then uh, we already have the have the queues. Um, what can explain this? Um, what can explain this is firstly inventory effects. That's related also to our stockpiling case. We all have inventories of certain products. That is, uh, we require a certain stock of um, of things. For instance, we require a certain amount of water, I don't know, amount of uh, soups, amount of noodles, and also of, of services. That is, services such as uh, haircuts, for instance. That is, um, once you can't supply these goods, your inventory levels go down. And this is particularly the case for those stores which were closed. Uh, for instance, furniture stores, for instance, hair cutters, for instance, do-it-yourself stores. That is, for all those products, the consumer's inventory levels have been continuously declining during the crisis. That is, once the store is open, more people have the need to refill their inventory levels. That is, it's more likely that people have an urgent need to go to the store to buy something. Uh, and this explains part of the additional demand. Uh, this is combined also with regulatory, regulatory focus theory and time discounting that um, people usually uh, would have an approach rather than avoidance orientation. They would try to tackle things as soon as possible in Western context. That is, kick things off, get things done, and this would then also um, explain why people rush to the store in the first few days because they want to be proactive. Also, they have more time partially. Yeah? So that is also a good explanation. And this situation where people well, have low inventory levels and more time and are potentially anxious is combined with a situation where the retailers have limited capacity because they have 
the distance regulations. So less people can go in, but more people might, or a normal level of people might want to go in, and this then creates the queues. Uh, final level, a uh, final final aspect, that's the uh, the nice living room down here. Uh, this is what I would refer to as the new Biedermeier, uh, or in English you might say cocooning, uh, in contrast to the early uh, 19th century period. Um, as the time spent at home increases, people also focus more on domestic products, furniture, DIY products, gardening, that type of stuff. So these things move into focus. We could see this initially when the demand for DIY, demand for furniture went up because people, well, they simply have more time and hence they, um, they also have more time to think about these aspects which are in their daily proximity. Hence, uh, I would expect that that there we we have an, an, uh, a focus on these items. Or we can see a focus on these items. However, once that focus on the domestic shifts, as people can go out again, can spend time out in the sun, I expect that also this focus on domestically relevant products such as furniture and DIY uh, will decrease. The second aspect, um, increasing need for convenience, particularly in, in food delivery. Uh -huh. um, I think this is independent of the crisis situation. Either people have a need for convenience or not. And I would expect that in this in the crisis, um, that to the contrary, people have more extra time and they might have less money to pay for convenience. And hence, uh, convenience might become less relevant. So all the commentators argue that people get a taste of the convenience now, and then they will later not be, be willing to go back to an inconvenient situation. Well, um, that might also be related to or might not become effective, uh, potentially as some people might have restrained resources, but also as um, as well, convenience is not really related to the crisis. So I also don't think that 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 the Corona crisis will affect our uh, our overall convenience perception. Good. Uh, with these three aspects, I, I think we can we can comment a bit on the or I've commented on the overall change. Stockpiling, I think, is a momentary thing, although overall levels might increase a bit. Queuings are not um, are not irrational, but kind of natural because our inventory levels are down, and then some people might need to buy in a market which has lower capacity. And I'm I'm a bit hesitant as to a ch overall shifts in consumption, as I might have impressed expressed as this new beta Maya, which we have right now, um, is also right now because we're a lot of time at home. And then once we can go outside again more openly, I think this focus also shifts back to drinking other beer or, or other aspects uh, outside in the sun rather than um, looking at the next furniture at home as we usually do in the summer. Um, with this, I, I conclude my, my, my presentation on these four aspects. So we've talked about firstly, uh, overall grocery, um, we've talked about secondly, uh, Netflix, thirdly, Amazon, and fourthly, um, the overall new normal. I, I believe that grocery online increased substantially, but is also coming down. Netflix, I think, did not profit that much. Amazon was rather, rather hurt. Uh, and we've just talked about the, uh, the, the behavioral change. I think everybody has that still in mind. Good. Um, thanks for your attention. And I'm um, I'm going back to the questions now. Um, and would be very happy to to answer things if you are interested in uh, in something. So, Eric, many thanks for your insightful talk. Um, as Eric just said, we will move over to the Q and A now. So, please, everybody. Type in your questions into the Q&A chat, which you should be able to see. I will read out the questions to you, Eric, and then we'll go bit by bit. So first question, Eric, would you say the online grocery has been increasing in special areas, city versus rural areas? I think yes, um, but this is not Corona related. Beforehand, online grocery was not that available in rural areas. Um, there, uh, I think the uh, um, the grocery was online grocery was much lower beforehand and is also much less available. That's the first part of the answer. Secondly, I think also the risk perception in rural areas is much lower. That is, rural areas, at least in Germany, have been affected much less severely, and the rural population seems to be um, perceived lower lower risk levels because they are anyhow more spaciously apart. So I think if we identify the risk perception as the core driver of online grocery, 
as the risk perception is lower in rural areas, I would also expect that the shift to uh, to online uh, online grocery delivery models is less substantiated, if it's at all possible to get online grocery delivered in, let's say, Delitzsch. Uh, that's not that rural, but uh, other other smaller parts uh, of the country. Okay, another user question. Uh, decline Amazon. You argued this would be a decline. However, your chart showed a strong seasonality of Amazon sales around Christmas. Compared to Q1 2020, your chart showed a strong increase. So do you think that your interpretation of the data is sufficient? Ah, good, good, good and critical question. Um, we have seen strong growths year over year um, for all quarters of Amazon. That is, any of the last quarters has shown a growth, let's say 30, 40 percent over the last um, over the last year. That is nothing uncommon. The company is growing strongly. They're opening new markets. They just entered the Netherlands, for instance, this spring. They are growing and they're growing massively. But this has nothing to do with the Corona crisis. The, the growth in the uh, in the Q1 20, um, 2020 is not larger than the growth in any of the previous quarters. So I would uh, stick with my interpretation, although I think it's a good observation. The, the, they have grown by 40%, but they've grown by 40% or more the previous years as well. Okay, thank you. What about increased returns because of more shoppers are testing? Are they the key driver for increased costs normally, you think? Oh, that's a very good point. Um, I think I haven't put this on my list, but I definitely will. This is a, is a very good point. If people are having these selection orders, then um, you would also have more costs. However, um, as Amazon is not that strong in fashion, um, I don't expect that there will be that many uh, um, uh, trial orders. And also Amazon's, um, Amazon's delivery policy that is prioritizing essential items deprioritized fashion and books and all these types of things. So if I were a consumer personally, I would during Corona not have ordered fashion items on, on Amazon because Zalando was delivering normally, for instance, uh, while Amazon was not. So I would have shifted there uh, and exploited their faster delivery. And Amazon, I think people were ordering staple goods and had to order staple goods because other things were not that delivered that strongly. And for staple goods, the, 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 the return items or the return share is not that critical. So generally, I think that's a really good idea for Amazon. Mm, I, I doubt that they had more returns during this time because they're not that strong fashion and fashion was all at somewhere else, I guess, during this time. Thank you. Next question. In the long run, do you expect a shift in fashion slash fashion retail regarding opening hours and seasons? At the beginning of the crisis, many brands complained about the short duration of seasons as they couldn't sell their stocks just now, or do you think as soon as the crisis is forgotten, everything will be back to normal? Mm, well, this I think strongly relates to this fast fashion um, model in, in fashion retail. That is, um, fashion retailers would be having 30, 40 more uh, different, let's say, seasons in, in a year as they bring up products and new products every week. Um, I think it would be a tea leaf reading um, to interpret whether whether that strong seasonality in fast fashion would be coming to an end. Certainly, I think we can reasonably expect that, that the depreciation of fashion items is going to be massive because, well, I think the ordering process for the spring fashion had been already concluded when the crisis hit, uh, let's say, at least Western Europe uh, and the United States. So um, spring items were in. Uh, and then now have to be sold at strongly reduced prices. Um, that that cut might lead to uh, might lead to uh, to a perception that this strong seasonality might not be desirable. Uh, on the other hand, those retailers which really have a really fine grained um, seasonality, that is, which have a lot of small mini seasons, they might not have pre-ordered that much compared to those retailers which had the traditional season, spring, summer, fall, winter, um, because they had so many mini seasons that they would um, more oftentimes reorder. So they, they might not have been as strongly affected by the crisis. But again, this I think this gets into murky and vague territory. And um, 
and I don't know. Uh, regarding opening hours, I think this was your first question. It might be that we see a bit more liberal treatment of opening hours, particularly in Germany, as everybody tries to help brick and mortar retail out of uh, out of their plight. And then cities uh, and federal states might be a bit more open towards granting Sunday openings and, and these types of things. So yes, that might be a case. I doubt whether this will be kind of a long term extension in, in opening hours in, in the German society. OK, next question. How do you see the impact of home office on the current retail and consumer trend? A good point, I think. I think <laughs> it's again, I think we can see part of this in, in the consumption patterns which we've looked at. Uh, I think people were ordering um, grocery more, buying more grocery because they had to feed themselves at home. Uh, that that focus on furniture might also be partially explained by people having to create a new home office. Mm. So this might also be related to this that we have in, uh, had an increase there. We certainly saw a decline in in business fashion. Mm. That is, people were not are ordering um, ordering that many uh, suits and, and and shirts and that type of stuff. At least I didn't. So. I don't know whether one should take that anecdotal evidence as, as over market um, market indication, but I think it's fair to assume that people were ordering less uh, less business fashion. Whether that is lasting, I don't know. I would again argue through inventory levels. Now people have a nicely furnished um, apartment. Um, they they might run low on on new shirts and suits and that type of stuff, and both might then level out. Less demand on. On, on furniture for uh, for the home office in the coming months, more demand for uh, for suits and these types of things once uh, once we can all go back to the office. Thank you. The next question um, for industries that show the decline, for instance, the diesel cars, do you think bringing in the new a new product mix in the company portfolio would be beneficial with respect to purchase power? Oh, difficult to uh, to disentangle this question. <laughs> I, I I have to admit. I mean, the new product mix. If I come from from as a marketer, uh, my answer would be that the product mix and my product product offering should be related to consumers' needs. And um, the needs with regards to mobility, they um, generally should be unrelated to the um, to the crisis that is I either um, I either have a need for a certain mobility for going a certain distance or for a certain cost of of delivery that type of stuff so i think these these um, needs with regards to which car i pick are not affected through the corona crisis what is affected is the price for certain um, for certain mobility forms of mobility and uh, I think as the price for, for gasoline, diesel and ordinary has gone down, um, the pressure to shift to, uh, to electronic mobility might be less severe right now. That would caution. But I think that the evaluation of the product mix, be that in car or something else, should be, should be done based on needs. And then we should, should assess whether these needs change during the crisis, lastingly change. And that should, should should determine my product mix. OK, um, another feedback. Great session, Eric. Uh, will there be an update when Q2 figures are available as kind of a follow up? Well, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> depends on depends on how long the HHL um, expert talk session here in this remote forum continues. I think we all hope that um, that we can meet in person at HHL and teach uh, teach and meet. I think this is what uh, what HHL as the Persönliche Hochschule uh, is all about. So uh, whilst I hope that uh, that this series continues, I also hope that it's going to be a, a live session. And then there's many more talks of my colleagues coming up. So I think they have um, they have a lot of things to say. And then potentially in Q2 or Q3, there might be um, time again to go for um, to go for consumption and retail again. Very good answer. Uh, another feedback. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, you have focused on B2C online consumption. Have you, by any chance, seen a different consumption in B2B? Mm, for B2B, I think I can't give a data-driven 
uh, answer right now. I focus this and my, my investigation of this on, on, on B2C. Uh, I think B2B will be affected uh, by a reverse order. Those B2B industries where the, the, the final B2B partner is very close to the consumers and has a strong increase, they will not be affected. Everybody delivering to grocery uh, probably can, uh, can see this, that there's rather an increased demand. Everybody who is delivering to, uh, to those industries which have seen a decline, potentially fashion players, uh, they will see a decrease in demand. So I would expect that um, the B2B reaction will be delayed um, versus the B2C reaction as these patterns um, that will later arrive in the, in the B2B uh, environment. Uh, but that's as far as I can go, I guess, with the reasonable uh, substantiated answer. Okay, in your opinion, what should be the biggest lessons learned for businesses after this pandemic? I think this is almost the, or this is more of a strategic question. Um, so uh, I don't think from my perspective, I can, um, I can answer for, um, for businesses as a whole. Um, with regards to um, with regards to, to to retailers, I think these these one off changes are really difficult to to, to estimate. General advice would be well, retailers, uh, be that online or offline, should focus on their uh, projection with regards to uh, the demand. But then um, these random shocks, we could almost call them, such as a as a virus pandemic. They are difficult to predict. The, predict that's why they are called random shocks. Um, so it's difficult. Um, one might suggest that they would factor in a bit more um, room to breathe in terms of uh, in terms of inventory levels, having higher inventory levels potentially um, to supply. But this also has a downside because uh, well, if you have a strong demand right now, you're sitting on the high inventory levels. Um, but particularly with regards to how strongly businesses are leveraged. Uh, this is more again the financial aspect, but um, I think many of the retailers right now are noticing that they've been um, leveraging too strongly, that they're operating on quite a fairly a thin, a thin cash flow. Uh, this they're dependent on constant business. And I think that is something many businesses learn that a bit more conservative management um, might not be bad um, to, to insulate yourselves against these sudden demand drops. Um, but um, I think that's probably the only overall aspect I can give. Perfect. There's more and more questions flying in. So the next one is, what do you think will be the impact of, on, of COVID on Hollywood and therefore on streaming industry in the coming time? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I've, I've talked about Netflix. I, I think the, the, the demand for, for streaming, whilst it has increased, it, doesn't, it hasn't increased as strongly as we would expect. Um, I, from a consumer perspective, I think there is, if they can't produce new content, um, then there is less interest in watching streaming. I think they're dependent on, on quality content. If they can't produce the movie studios and also Netflix, um, there is the value of the good declines, and then there might also be less demand for uh, for for Netflix. Um, but beyond the overall shift from classic Hollywood to uh, to streaming, which is as the shift from cinema to TV or from silent movie to a voice movie, um, there is no specific crisis uh, component to this. Um, in the last part of your presentation, you predicted no changes in the behavior of customers in the long run regarding your three hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Do you think there might be a special behavior that will be affected, for example, home office? I, I think, I mean, people will, what is adopted is technological adoption, for instance. And that is how people utilize certain services. And I think, for instance, remote working, that is something which definitely will see, uh, will see a market change. Um, we all notice this. We all have downloaded all the apps now. We're holding classes and talks online. So I think um, that will be a market change. I also, I think, don't get me wrong. I believe that also in grocery and online grocery, there is going to be a step change. I just don't think that this step change is big enough to make online grocery dominant. They will have managed to increase and there will be more people buying it and, and th th there will be more online grocery. 
And uh, but I, I don't think that step is big enough to, to to say that this is the only and the biggest and the whatever winner of the crisis. I think it's not big enough for that. Um, but I think there will be changes. Home office, I think, is a is a very good example. I think digitalization will be will be pushed through this. And uh, this is it is definitely one market changes. OK, thank you. How can you draw a conclusion based on spikes found in Google Trends? Once a customer does the research and found a store of desire, wouldn't they go directly to that store's website? For example, search suggestions, browser tab, etc. So do they so that they wouldn't not even show up in the Google Trends? Yeah, sure. Good question. I mean, I think we can uh, we can be very critical of uh, of Google Trends, and I think this is what I've employed here is I would say a proxy strategy. Um, because it's difficult to get um, direct visitor data for many websites. Uh, you could employ Alexa.com or something like this. This is a service which focuses on website traffic. Um, but I think Google, Google Trends is a good indicator. If everybody uh, who is working, for instance, with attribution models um, knows the expression that uh, last click is not um, is not effective because people would usually uh, go somewhere else beforehand. And the um, and oftentimes the last click would be a, a, a search on on Google because people are too lazy to type. Um, as this is imperfect, obviously people would store store their um, would store their um, their searches as um, as links or keep the tabs open. I think it's an imperfect proxy, but it's the best uh, proxy which we have. If we look at uh, the statistical data, German statistical office doesn't doesn't give that detailed information. Even the US, we don't get it. So we have to factor it by something if we want to, uh, to drill deep. And um, in the search history, oftentimes we have a um, we have a search type at the end. So I I believe it's a good proxy, but it's certainly not a perfect. Uh, it's a perf it's not a perfect proxy. Um, mm -hmm. We've got another comment here. Regarding Netflix and Co, I'm afraid looking at the 220 QA data only doesn't doesn't only show you the full picture yet, as the lockdowns only affected a few days of March, while April was the month where the life was most changed for people. Hence, Q2 numbers would be more in, would be the more interesting ones. No, oh, I agree. Um, we have to monitor the continuous uh, continuous trend, but uh, with the um, I think. If we look at their performance, I fully agree. We need more. The, the the trends data, if we accept this as a good proxy, doesn't show a high high demand during the the subsequent weeks. So right now the demand has even declined versus the last weeks uh, and versus kind of late March, early April. So if we follow this, I think it's a it's a very good it's a good hypothesis and potentially in Q2 they do better. Um, but just looking at the at the search interest for Netflix, we don't see that the demand has like is continuing to grow. OK, we've got three more questions now. So a lot um, of questions. Yeah, I think there's a lot <laughs> so, of questions. They, they keep yeah. flying in. So the first one of the last three, which behaviors of customers that have changed during this time do you think could be maintained after the pandemic? Which behaviors of customers that have changed, that have changed now that will stay after pandemic um, has kind of left or has has been worked through? Uh, I think people might generally be be more health conscious, more focused on health related products and sanitization and these types of things. Mm -hmm. I think this is something if we um, if we train ourselves to do this, and I think. Everybody understands that it's a meaningful thing to uh, clean your hands and, and that type of stuff. We should have learned this as kids <laughs> to wash our hands frequently. Uh, and for my part, didn't. Um, uh, then uh, that is a meaningful thing, and I think the focus on this might change. I think what I've also indicated as the second aspect, my inventory levels at home might overall increase. Um, I come from uh, I come from from Saxony, born and raised. Race here. If I look at my parents, uh, they, most of the lives that lived in Eastern Germany, their inventory levels are really high all the time okay. because at that that the, the the supply was not always granted, and then people would have really high inventory levels. Now, if if we look at now the current situation and and Corona might have indicated to people that a, a, in a continuous supply is not always granted 
or might be sometimes limited somewhat, then I would expect that one lasting change is that my inventory levels generally would increase. Um, so people can make use of their freezers or, uh, or <laughs> regional storage cupboards, which they purchased and put in cans or frozen fish yep. or vegetables. Huh? OK, perfect. So another comment. Thank you very much for your lecture. Do you think that it goes along to the words you've probably just said? Do you think that the current world situation generates consumer awareness regarding the environment and new forms of consumption? Mm, well, I think this has been um, this has been oftentimes mentioned. I, I've not picked up on this in my talk huh? that uh, people are flying less, um, traveling less, and is this then now helping the environment? Uh, I think the, uh, um, the, the the present situation. If I continue with my theorizing, um, the, 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 the the this the environmental concern is unrelated to the health concern. So uh, I guess that the health concern is um, is crowding out or is um, exceeding the, the 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 environmental concern right now. Okay. And I think it will continue to do so uh, for some time. So I, I, I would rather be uh, uh, cautious to say that this is leading to a more sustainable behavior. And, and the second aspect which, which I would like to pick up upon is this idea of inventory levels. We can have inventory levels of soup and of haircuts and of suits and all, all these types of things. I think also people have inventory levels of, uh, of private enjoyment uh, and traveling and these types of things. Mm -hmm. And it could be that, that, that the, 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 the inventory levels in these aspects drop. And once we are allowed to do things again uh, without risk and everything is fine again, uh, there might be a kind of a really strong revamp where people go back to flying to, I don't know, Lisbon for the weekend uh, and that type of uh, unsustainable types of behavior. Um, so it might be that we have a, a reaction back. So I would be cautious to hope for uh, more sustainable lifestyles. OK, thank you. Very last question. Maybe Google Trends as a proxy indicator gives info about the, a specific group or type of customers. Is there research on this? Mm, I think from what I've seen in uh, kind of in practice, uh, I've, I've not seen a differentiated analysis of who is losing Google Trends as means of accessing uh, of accessing websites. I think generally it's it's fairly representative that is it holds across different groups. I, I think I would have to make up lay theories here who uses this more. more. Uh, there is the grandma who doesn't use know how to use bookmarks or there is the, uh, I don't know, the very stressed out consumer who doesn't have 20 tabs open or the uh, consumer chaos who has more, uh, cartic consumer who has more tabs open and thus it's more or less representative. I think this is it. Detailed question. I haven't seen uh, research upon this. It's an interesting point. Probably it's uh, another research project which we should look at uh, for the next talk. <laughs> so thank you very much. A virtual round of applause to you for all the insights and the information and for your time especially and for answering all the questions. It was a pleasure. And um, it was for me as well. For everyone um, being tuned in, we are hoping for you to sign up to the next talk to be there. And um, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we're looking forward um, to seeing you around. Yeah, thank you for listening in. It was a pleasure. <laughs>